We're going to start today's class with some chapter 9 problems from the homework. I chose these problems because it seemed like folks had difficulties on these. And um, if you had difficulties on these problems and you feel like you could have gotten a better grade, if you understood a little bit more, send me a course message. And if you've already kind of used up all of your tries, I can reset that for you. But you need to send me in course messages a list of the ones from chapter 9, the homework and the quiz, that you need to be reset. There were a lot of folks who emailed and sent course messages asking for extensions and help. And so I figured that it would be best to give you an extension, go over a couple of the questions, just so that you have a better idea of what you need to be doing and then you can have a little more time to get the best grade that you can. So without further ado, let me, here we go. So first question, assuming constant conditions, how many milliliters of oxygen gas react to give two liters of dichlorine trioxide? And then there's a reaction written out below. We need to figure out how many milliliters of oxygen gas and our given information is there. We've got two liters And we're trying to figure out the number of milliliters of oxygen gas. Starting with the volume, we're asked about a volume. So it must be volume to volume. Now normally you just go right ahead and, you know, write your mole mole factors and stuff and bam. But I warned you about this. All the reactions or all the equations that you see they may not be balanced, so you may have to balance them. This is one of those cases. So if you get it now and you wanna go ahead and try to solve this problem ahead of me, go for it. If not, and you wanna see how I work through it, stick with me and you'll see. On the reactant side, we've got two chlorine atoms and two oxygen atoms. On the product side, two chlorine atoms, but we've got three oxygen atoms. So we need to fix that. In order for us to do stoichiometry of any kind, we have to start with a balanced equation. So we'll start with the oxygen the lowest common denominator is six. So we've got to multiply the product side by two and the reactant side by three, where we see oxygen. Now that's gonna change some things. So we need to take stock of what changes happened outside of just the oxygen. Chlorine hasn't changed on the reactant side, but now we've got six oxygens, three times two. On the product side, we've now got two times two to give us four chlorine atoms and six oxygen atoms. Now the chlorine is not balanced, so we have to balance that. Multiply by 2 on the reactant side. Now we've got 4 chlorines on the reactant side and, th and 6 oxygens. And then 4 and 6 on the other side. Now we're balanced. The rest of it is easy. 
It's a volume to volume question. And since all of the gases are in constant conditions, we can just say liters instead of moles. I'll show you what I mean. We're starting with two liters. And we need to write some kind of a mole mole factor. Well, here we can use a volume factor instead. You're still looking at the chemical equation that's balanced. And we need to write one that takes into account the oxygen and the dichlorine trioxide. Oxygen goes on top. and the product goes on the bottom. When you do this, you're left with three liters of oxygen gas. But look back at the question. It says milliliters. So there's a question, why don't you have to write the whole thing out? So when you say the whole thing, I'm not sure what you mean. So with volume to volume, you literally just need a volume factor. That's like a mole ratio that you write, only instead of moles, it's liters. It's the easiest problem type that we went over last week. So you don't have to convert anything. Yes, I can hear you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the reason is we're trying to get from the amount of, so we need to figure out how much oxygen, right? So the starting information tells us we've made two liters of the product, the dichlorine trioxide. And we have to figure out how much oxygen gas we need to react to actually make that. So... What we said last week was that for the mole ratio, which we'll also say the mole or the volume ratio, is in the form of B over A, where B is equal to the unknown. So that's the one that you want to know about. And A is equal to whatever... Uh, compound we're given that we know about. So in this case, the A is the dichlorine trioxide gas and the B is the oxygen gas. So our ratio is going to be liters of oxygen gas over the product. Does that help explain it a little bit better? No problem. Okay. So we're not done with this question yet. We got the number of liters, but the question is asking for how many milliliters. So we have to convert three liters to milliliters. There's 1,000 milliliters in one liter. So we end up with 3,000 milliliters of oxygen gas. If you need to do sig figs for this, we need three significant figures. 
because there's three significant figures in our given information. So the key points here, which I'm running out of room, make sure you have a balanced equation. We started with balanced equations because we didn't want to focus on that. We did that in chapter seven. What I wanted to focus on was how to do the stoichiometry part. On the homework, you've got to balance the equation or write an equation and balance it. And then you can use that to answer the question. The other thing you want to make sure to do is watch your units. This question was asking for milliliters. So even if you balance the equation and you got the right ratio, if you answered three liters, it would be wrong because the question asked for milliliters. Those two things were pretty common throughout the problem set for the homework and the quiz. So uh, knowing that, I think a lot of you can do a lot better on your homework and you will stop stressing so much about it. Don't want anybody to stress. It's school, not the end of the world. So does that help a little bit? I have a couple of more um, homework questions that I'm going to go over with you before we get to chapter 10. So let me know if that, if that was helpful for you. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. You had to consider this reaction. It's a combustion reaction, which we didn't really talk about these. We don't cover them in Chem 103. But they're fair game in terms of just a chemical reaction that you can balance. How many moles of butane gas react to produce two moles of water? So for this, you need to balance the equation. I'm going to help you guys out a little bit. Sometimes when you're balancing combustion reactions, you have to use a fraction for the oxygen gas coefficient. Once you do the fraction, then you can multiply through and have whole numbers and yada yada. But we don't really care about that as much as we want the equation to be balanced. With those coefficients, this equation is now balanced. Take a second, jot it down, because I'm pretty sure you all have butane um, as one of your questions. And if you don't, this kind of form factor will help you see what you have to do in terms of balancing. Once you balance this equation, it's just a mole to mole conversion. So this was the sticking point here. From there, we just have to write out what we're doing, what's the question? So we've got two moles of water that we're given. And we're trying to figure out how many moles of butane gas. Same form factor for our mole ratio. It's always B over A. The B is the unknown. 
A is what we're given. And then you look at your chemical equation to see what you write for your ratio. This is water. This is butane. B, we're putting one mole of butane over five moles of water. We cancel out the moles of water. We're going to be left with moles of butane. You divide 2 by 5 and you get 0 0.4. So the reason is because to balance it, if you if you look at how many, um, when you go through and balance, you're going to have an odd number of oxygens that you need to balance out the product side. We can go through and multiply everything by two, and then we'd have whole numbers. You don't have to go that far to get this done. If you want to talk more about how to balance this equation specifically, you can stay after and I'll show you the steps of how I balanced it. I didn't want to go too deep into that just because of time. But if you want to see how it's done, I can do that in a couple of minutes at the end of class. Is that fair? Okay. So if you're interested, stay after. Two minutes, we can get it done. Otherwise... You can just take it and run. No harm in either one. So that's the second question that I wanted to help you guys with. Here's the third one. You've got 10 liters of hydrogen chloride gas. And it reacts with 43.5 liters of oxygen gas you need to figure out the volume of chlorine gas that's produced. We're assuming that all the gases are at the same temperature and pressure, which means we can use volume instead of moles. Save ourselves a step. This equation, again, not balanced. But let's talk about what we have before we start balancing. We're starting with two volumes, 10 liters of HCl and 43.5 liters of oxygen gas. We're trying to get to the number of liters of chlorine gas. So it's volume to volume but we have two reactants that are mixing together. And last week, what we said was when we have two things mixing together, that's probably going to be a limiting reactant problem. So we've got to do two volume to volume problems and then figure out how much chlorine gas we actually make. So balance the equation, we do two volume to volume questions, and then we figure out how much product we actually make. So there's three steps to this. The first part, balancing the equation.
start out by looking at the lay of the land. See what we have. So clearly, very much not balanced. The recommendation here is to start with the oxygen because that's kind of the most complex. We've got two oxygen atoms together on one side and we've only got one on the other. Lowest common denominator here is two. We multiply the product side by two wherever we see oxygen. That's going to make some changes, not only to the oxygen, but also to the hydrogen. So we need to see what that does. We've still got the one on the product side, or on the reactant side and one chlorine, two oxygens. But now we've got four hydrogens and we balanced our oxygen. The next thing that I balanced was the hydrogen. We're gonna multiply the reactant side by four. So now we've got four of hydrogen and chlorine and two oxygens. Now the chlorine's a problem. We put a two in front of the chlorine gas on the product side and that should do it. Now we're balanced. Once that's done, we can move on to doing the volume to volume questions. So the first volume to volume question that we have to do is if we have 10 liters of hydrogen chloride gas, how much chlorine gas would we make? We look at the balanced chemical equation What we don't know, the unknown, is the chlorine gas. So the number of liters of that from the balanced chemical equation goes on top. On the bottom, <clears throat> we're going to do four liters of HCl. My allergies have been trying to claim my life today, y'all. So we're going to be in liters of chlorine gas. In your calculator, you do 10 times 2 divided by 4. 10 times 2 is 20 divided by 4 gives you 5.
The second mini question that we have to do is with the 43.5 liters of oxygen gas. We need to know how many liters of chlorine gas we would make if we started with that. Again, we're going back to the chemical equation that is balanced. We're putting the number of liters of chlorine at the top and the number of liters of oxygen in the bottom. You're doing 43.5 times 2, which gives you 87 liters of chlorine. The final step, which I know these problems are exhausting, which reactant makes the least product? Because we're not going to make both of these. We're figuring out which one will make the least amount of product because that's what we make. Last time I checked, 5 is much less than 87. So we're going to make 5 liters of chlorine gas. So that was the last one that I put in there to try to help you out some when it comes to some of the concepts from chapter 9. Hopefully that's helpful to you. And like I said, if you would like to have a chance to redo some questions from chapter 9, send me a course message by 5 o'clock. Let me know what you need me to do, which questions, so write which exercises they are, which numbers. And I'll go in and do that for you. So this is a one-time thing. You get it into me by five. Some people were sitting there writing out the message during class. Because <laughs> I teach multiple sections of 103. That's perfectly fine. We'll also likely end class early. Because we're going to get through everything that I have for you. So. You'll be covered if you need a little time to go and look at Mastering Chemistry and see what you need. But send it to me via course messages, not email, course messages. All right. Any questions? If you have more questions about the homework, you can send those via course messages as well. So if you need a little extra hint here or there, I may be able to help you, you know, say, oh, you need to start here or... Don't forget this unit, that kind of thing. So hit me up in course messages. More than willing to help you out. So let me know if you're good and you're ready to keep going or if you need a minute to kind of catch up. Then we're going to start chapter 10 on gases. Now, I made the pre-recorded video and posted that. It's got more detail and it will, you know, kind of fill in the gaps in terms of the concepts. What I'm focusing on here is giving you some more sample problems so that when you're doing your homework, you have samples for the math problems. I'll briefly cover some of the topics and some of the concepts so that you're not completely in the dark if you haven't um, watched that watched that lecture but please make sure that you do 
because I am not putting out everything in this live lecture. It would take a lot of time, and I think that going over the math is far more helpful. So with that said, here we go. We're going to start with the five properties of gases, which we actually talked about already in Chapter 3 when we were talking about solids, liquids, and gases. I'm not going to read through them here, but you do need to know these and understand what they mean. So this is good fodder for kind of multiple choice questions, conceptual, conceptual questions, and things like that. So make sure that you understand these and that you know them. Not going to read them. I know y'all can read. And if you're like, wait, 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 it's already in the notes for the pre-recorded lecture and it will be in the notes for today's live session. So if you need to fill in some space or just kind of leave room if you like to write things in your notebook, you can leave room there. I will talk a little bit about atmospheric pressure. So gas pressure in general is the result of gas molecules going in all these random directions and striking the walls of whatever container they're in. When you crank up the temperature, the molecules move more quickly, they strike the walls more often, and with more force. So you're going to increase the pressure when you increase that temperature. Atmospheric pressure is all the air molecules in our environment pushing down on us and everything else on the Earth. The barometer was invented to measure atmospheric pressure, which it does change based on weather patterns and things like that. On the right, there's an image of a barometer. You have liquid mercury, which mercury is the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. It's very dense. You've got this open container that has mercury in it and an inverted glass tube. When the atmospheric pressure pushes down on the mercury, some of that mercury will travel up this glass tube. The height of the mercury is what you can measure. And that is one of the units of pressure. So 760 millimeters of mercury that's a barometer reading and that is the equivalent of one atmosphere you also see on here 29.9 inches of mercury 760 tor so that alludes to the fact that there are lots of different units of pressure that we're going to be talking about. And I have that here. Do not memorize this slide. Don't, measure, don't memorize the units of gas pressure. You will get the information that you need with the question. And for your homework, you can always look back at this chart if need be. I do want to point out though, that some of these say exactly I'm only going to stick to the ones that I typically quiz on. So I typically will ask you things about atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, and tor. Exactly here in parentheses means that you're dealing with an exact number. And exact numbers do not contribute to determining the number of significant figures in your answer. So that's kind of a throwback to when we first did sig figs. Exact numbers like one atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury, 760 tor, when we're doing pressure conversions, don't use those numbers to determine sig figs. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. 
So let's do a sample pressure conversion. For all of these problems, I'm going to work them through. If you've already watched the video and you feel comfortable to kind of try it on your own, you're more than welcome to do that. The goal here is to give you more exposure to the problem types and how to identify them. Here we have the barometric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury. What is the barometric pressure in atmospheres? So in this type of a question, you either have a chart or a table or something that gives you the information you need, or it'll be in parentheses, you know, note one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. You might be saying to yourself, well, that looks kind of like one of those thing of what sees we were doing in chapter two. That thing of what sees a unit equation. And they're all over chemistry. Whenever we have unit equations, that means that we can write unit factors. And those we can use to convert from one, um, one unit to another. The conversion factors or unit factors for this would be one atmosphere over 760 millimeters of mercury and the reciprocal. I'll label these as our unit factors. Now we can set up the problem. We're starting with 755 millimeters of mercury. I have to choose one of these unit factors to get from millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. Is it A or is it B that I need to use? It's A. Make sure that you cancel your units and convince yourself that you've put in the right unit factor. And then all you're doing is division, 755 divided by 760. When you do that, you need to make sure that you have the right number of sig figs. We were given 755 millimeters of mercury, which has three sig figs. That's what our answer needs to have. So that's our answer, 0.993 atmospheres. You won't necessarily have to just do a plain old pressure conversion for your final exam, but this will be a part of a question. So it's something you need to be able to do as part of a bigger question. Questions here, or are we good to keep going? And we'll keep going. Next topic, variables that affect gas pressure. I'm not going to go into detail for all of these, but I will tell you what relationship each of these variables have. Make sure that you go to the video to understand it. We're also going to cover some of these in the gas laws that we cover later on. So you're not going to totally miss out. You're just going to sort of miss out. Three variables that affect pressure. The volume, temperature, number of molecules. 
volume will always be a V. And the relationship between pressure and volume is an indirect relationship. You'll also see it called inversely proportional. So I want to introduce that vocabulary to you because you're going to see it in this lecture. What that means is that if the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. The opposite thing happens to it. And we're going to see that shortly with Boyle's Law. Next, we have the temperature. Temperature is always a T. And that's a direct relationship. You may also see directly proportional. Same thing. Increase the temperature, increase the pressure. The third variable is the number of molecules. That's usually represented as moles, which is N. Again, there's a direct relationship here. If you increase the amount of gas and keep everything else constant, you're going to increase the pressure simply because there's more gas molecules in a smaller space. You've got more molecules striking the walls. So these three I spell out in more detail in the pre-recorded video. Please go there and get that information. This is just the, the surface. I'll pause here for a second and make sure that everybody's caught up. I'll wait for maybe about 10 seconds and then I'll move on if there's no questions. Now we're getting into all the gas laws. We're going to cover several of them, and that's really the focus of today's lecture. The first law we're covering is Boyle's Law. It deals with pressure and volume. The volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure. So if you have high pressure, you've got a low volume. Low pressure, high volume. The equation for that is P1V1 equals P2V2. Whenever you see the ones as subscripts, those are your initial conditions of the gas. When you see a two as a subscript, we're talking about final conditions, what something has been changed to. You'll see that kind of nomenclature for all of these gas laws pretty much. So make sure that you remember which is which. For Boyle's law, increase the pressure, you decrease the volume, and vice versa. You decrease the pressure, you increase the volume. That's assuming that the temperature and the amount of gas is held constant. So that's Boyle's Law in a nutshell. Now I'm going to show you a sample problem. As always, when you're doing an exam or homework, you're not going to have the luxury of having a title that tells you which gas law to use. So you need to be able to read the problem, pick out the information that's relevant, assign variables, and from there figure out which gas law you need. That's the method that I'm going to be showing you today. If 
you have another method that works fine for you, go ahead and do that. Go for the gold. If you watch the video, you want to get some practice in, again, go for the gold. The world's your oyster. If you just want to kick back and watch some examples, take it in, and be ready to do some kind of practice next week, that's also fine. We've got a 7 liter sample of methane gas and it exerts a pressure of 1550 millimeters of mercury. What is the final pressure if the volume changes to 3.50 liters? So I always highlight the numbers with units and whatever unit or whatever item I'm supposed to find in the question. Then I go through and assign variables. So seven liters, that's a volume. So I know I, it's some kind of a V. And the first sentence of the problem is usually describing the initial conditions of the gas. So it's pretty safe to call that V1. That sample exerts a pressure of 1,550 millimeters of mercury. Again, it's in the first sentence. We're talking about a pressure here. So we're going to assign that P1. It's the initial pressure. The, the last number that we have is another volume. And it says that the volume changes to this. So that must mean it's our final condition. It's what the gas has been changed to. And the question is regarding the final pressure. So that's how I go through and pick out each of the pieces of information and assign a variable, whether it's a volume or a pressure or a temperature, and if it's an initial condition or a final condition. From there, I look at what variables I have. I've got all pressures and volumes. So when you're given information, is all pressures and volumes. You're going to use Boyle's Law. His law is P1 V1 equals P2 V2. I prefer to rearrange the equation with just the variables to solve for whatever it is that I need. In this case, I'm solving for P2 because that's my unknown. We have to isolate that on one side and get all the other variables on the other. Divide by V2 to do that. The result is P2 is equal to, I like to pull out the pressure, because it's kind of on its own, P1, times the ratio of V1 over V2. You'll see when we put in all of our numbers why this is convenient. The pressure that we're given in the problem is 1550 millimeters of mercury. V1 is 7 liters and V2 3.50 liters. When you arrange your equation this way, where you put together the volumes and the temperatures and the pressures, your units will cancel out. And it is very clear to see what unit your answer is in. We're looking for a pressure, so it should be in some unit of pressure. Now before we get all calculator happy, let's do a little bit of mental math. 
we're going from a volume of 7 liters to a volume of 3.5 liters. Is that an increase or a decrease in our volume? Going from 7 liters to 3.5 liters, did we increase or decrease? We decrease. Boyle's Law says, whatever happens to one, the opposite happens to the other. We had a decrease in our volume. So that should result in an increase of our pressure. So when you go to your calculator and put in all your numbers, you should expect to see something bigger than your initial pressure. I'd also recommend using parentheses like this, just to guarantee that you're getting the ratio of the volumes multiplied by the pressure. Your calculator will tell you this. But we need to have three sig figs because right now we've only got two. So that's how you solve a gas law problem that happens to be a Boyle's Law problem. Any questions here? I'll kind of pause for a second. I'll pause for about 10 seconds just to make sure everybody's on the same page. If you're trying to write notes down, you can get those down. And if you have a question, you can just raise your hand so I don't move on. Otherwise, I'll move on in about another five seconds or so. The next gas law that we're going to cover is Charles's law. And this one deals with volume and temperature. I want to point out for the gas laws, you're not, if I give you an equation sheet, which your take home, your final is going to be take home, but I'll still post an equation sheet to go along with the exam review. I'm not going to label the gas laws. So you'll see P1, V1 equals P2, V2, or you'll see this law V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, but it's not going to say Boyle's law or Charles's law. That's something that you need to know and recognize. So it was discovered that volume is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas in Kelvin. What does that mean? If you increase the volume, then you're also going to increase the temperature. And the opposite is true. If you decrease the volume, you'll decrease the temperature. But that temperature must be in Kelvin. We talked about Kelvin way back. I think it was maybe chapter 2. And I'll remind you, to get from Celsius to Kelvin, you take degrees Celsius and you add 273. If you have Fahrenheit, you have to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius, then Celsius to Kelvin. In these problems, you're going to be given mostly degrees Celsius. You need to remember to convert to Kelvin first. You cannot use gas law equations with degrees Celsius. It doesn't work. You'll get the wrong answer. 
So back to Charles's law. Direct relationship between volume and temperature. What we have written is a proportion, but it's not really helpful until you cross multiply. So you multiply V1 by T2 and V2 by V1. Then you can solve for your unknown. You'll need to do that first though, cross multiply. I'm gonna wait for a few seconds, make sure we're all caught up. And then the next thing I'll do is show you an example of how to use Charles's law. We've got a 132 liter helium balloon and it's cooled from 45 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. We need to find the final volume if the pressure remains constant. We do the same thing with these problems every time. Write down each number, assign a variable, and identify the gas law to use to solve the problem. One hundred thirty two liters. Liters is a volume. And usually that first sentence is telling you the initial conditions. So it's pretty safe to call it V one. The balloon is cooled from forty five degrees Celsius, which means that that's where it's starting. That's our T1. The final temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, which makes that T2. The question is asking about the final volume, which is V2. Remember, we have to convert all of our temperatures to Kelvin. It's up to you when you do this. If you want to just, oh, I see a temperature, it's in degrees Celsius, let me convert it. Or you figure out which gas law you want to use, rearrange your equation, and then you do your conversion. But as long as it happens before you start punching things into your calculator, you should be good to go. So if you add 273 to 45, you get 318 Kelvin, 25 plus 273 gives you 298. Whenever the given information is volumes and temperatures, you have to use Charles's law. that law is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. You've got to cross multiply first. Then you can solve for your unknown. We're trying to figure out V2. I like to circle it because it keeps me grounded. Sometimes you forget what it is that you're actually supposed to be isolating. So if you mark it, highlight it, underline it, something to show that it's different, that it's what you're isolating, that tends to help.
divide both sides by T1. Pull out that volume on its own and multiply that by the ratio of T2 over T1. Then we plug in the numbers. The initial volume was 132 liters. T2 is 298 Kelvin. And 318, that's our T1. Before we put all this into the calculator, let's think about what our results should be. The problem tells us that we're cooling this balloon which means that it's a decrease in temperature. Charles's law says whatever happens to the temperature, same thing's gonna happen to the volume. So we expect for volume to also decrease. Your calculator will give you that answer which is definitely lower than our original volume. But we need to have three sig figs. When you convert that temperature in to Kelvin, you now have three significant figures for your temperature. How are we doing so far? I feel like we're moving a little bit fast, but the gas law problems are pretty simple. But slow me down. I know people are happy about getting out of class early, so I'm trying to provide that experience for you. I know finals are among upon you, projects and all the things. So I'm trying to give you back some of your freedom. Let me know how we're doing with gas law, with gas law so far. All right. Then let's keep pushing. And thanks for your participation. Ain't but nine of us, including me. So we're pretty light today. But that's all right. Y'all get the benefit of knowing what's going on in class. Next law is Gay-Lussac's law. This law has to do with pressure and temperature. The pressure of a gas is directly proportional to the temperature. Very similar to what we saw with volume and temperature. You need to cross multiply here just like before. And from here, you can solve for your unknown. So let me show you a quick example of a Gay-Lussac's law problem. And then after that, we'll take a short break. We have a steel container that has nitrous oxide at 10.4 atmospheres. We're heating it from negative 5 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius, and we have to figure out the final pressure. 
Let's assign those variables. We might have to do a break a little bit sooner. Baby Hefner is trying to make an appearance, which he hasn't done in a while. We'll try to get through this problem first, and then we'll take a break. So it says that we're heating from negative 5 degrees Celsius to 15. So that's our T1. And our T2 is 15 degrees Celsius. We're asked about the final pressure. So that's a question mark. When you're given information just has pressures and temperatures, you're going to use Gay-Lussac's law. So there is Gay-Lussac's law. We first have to cross multiply. Then you isolate your unknown variable, which is P2 in this case. Divide by T1. And group your like terms together. Then you put in your numbers. And don't forget, you need to convert to Kelvin. So negative 5 degrees Celsius is 268 Kelvin. And 15 degrees Celsius is 288 Kelvin. Starting with 10.4 atmospheres, we're going to multiply by the ratio of T2 over T1. In our problem, we're heating up this container. So we are increasing the temperature. That means we should expect an increase in our pressure too. When you do the math, you get 11.2 atmospheres, which is an increase. And doing that little check can save you some points. So make sure that for the gas laws that you can do the mental check, you do it. Sometimes you put T1 instead of T2, and it throws everything off. So we're making pretty good time. We're going to take a break until 3.30. If you have any questions in the meantime, you can put them in the chat, and I'll address them at 3.30. All right, so it is 3.30, and we are going to get back to it. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to assume everybody is good so far. And the gas laws are kind of a relief after chapter 9 for most people. Stoichiometry is usually the hardest chapter, and then we kind of take it down a notch for chapter 10. The next gas law we'll cover is the combined gas law. So we're taking all three of the laws that we just talked about, Boyle's law, Charles's law, Gay-Lussac's law, and we put it all together in one equation.
what you need to note here is that you can have changes to the pressure, volume, and temperature, but the amount of gas remains constant. I'll show you how to how to manipulate this equation. Let's say that we want to solve for T2. The first thing you're going to do is cross multiply. You have P1 V1 T2 is equal to P2, V2, T1. Then you'll isolate a variable. We're solving for T2 in this example. So you divide both sides by P1, V1. The result is you have T2 on one side, and then remember to combine your like terms. So we've got T1, we pull that one out, then we've got P2 over P1 times V2 over V1. So combine your pressures combine your volumes and this will make life easier. Just wanted to give you an example outside that you can kind of go back to without digging through a problem. I'll pause here for a second. Now let's try using this equation. You have a 10 liter sample of carbon dioxide. It's at 300 Kelvin, one atmosphere. The new volume is six liters at 350 Kelvin. We need to figure out the new pressure in millimeters of mercury. Just like with all the other problems, you have to assign your variables first. The first sentence tells us about all of the initial conditions. That means we have V1, our first volume, or initial volume. 300 Kelvin is our T1. And one atmosphere is P1. The new volume, which is V2, is 6 liters, and our new temperature is 350 Kelvin. We need to figure out the new pressure in millimeters of mercury. So for this problem, we have everything in the kitchen sink. So when you're given information, has pressure, volume, and temperature, you're going to use the combined gas law. The other thing that we want to pay attention to is the units. We have to report this in millimeters of mercury. What we're given is atmospheres. So what I'm going to do is go through and do the calculation with atmospheres and then convert at the end. You could 
convert your pressure to atmospheres or to millimeters of mercury first and then do you know solve your equation either way as long as you end up in millimeters of mercury you're good to go This is the combined gas law. We cross multiply. Then we isolate our unknown variable. Our equation is going to be P2 is equal to, pull out that pressure and combine your volumes and your temperatures. Then you substitute in the numbers. And be careful here, it's really easy to put the number for V1 in place of V2 or something like that. So always double check, make sure that you assign your variables correctly and that you put your numbers in the right spot. So that's what you should have. All those units cancel and we're left with atmospheres, which is a pressure. And that's a good thing because we're solving for P2. So you get that answer in atmospheres. But we can't stop there because we have to convert this to millimeters of mercury. There are 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. with sig figs so there we go the only trick to this one was making sure that your units are right when you report your answer at the end so I'll pause here for about 10 seconds and if you have any questions, you can feel free to either raise your hand or throw it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. We're almost done, believe it or not. There's no questions. We're going to keep pushing. The next law is probably the easiest law to use, and this is Dalton's law of partial pressures. All it says is that the total pressure in a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the individual pressures of each gas. So let's say you decide to go scuba diving. Wouldn't be me. I'm not about swimming with the fishes. I'll look at them. They're beautiful creatures. But I'm not trying to go in there. That's too, the ocean is dangerous. 
and leave me out of it. I'll look at it. I'll go to the beach. That's about as far as I go. But if you decide to go scuba diving, you need some oxygen. You have a tank on your back. You have to breathe. But you're not just breathing pure oxygen. It's usually a combination of gases. So you'll have oxygen, nitrogen, and helium, something like that. It's called trimix, I believe. So if we wanted to figure out the total pressure for that, which I write PT instead of writing out total, then the total pressure in that tank that you're going to use when you go and swim with the turtles or something is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen gas plus the partial pressure of the nitrogen plus the partial pressure of helium. That's all that Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure says. Let's put that to use. We've got some noble gases mixed together. Helium, neon, argon, krypton. We've got all the partial pressures for each of them. And we have to figure out the total pressure of the sample. Not really a big deal here, but if you miss one thing, then you could get it wrong. And that thing is units. Krypton has a partial pressure that's written in atmospheres. Everything else is written in millimeters of mercury. This question doesn't specify whether you have to answer in atmospheres or millimeters of mercury, but to do the least amount of work, you should convert atmospheres two millimeters of mercury so that you can add everything together. And that's what we're going to do here. So the first step in this is to convert atmospheres to millimeters of mercury. Let's say the question asked for everything in atmospheres. Then you have to convert everything else to atmospheres. Okay. So this is just an example of what you have to do here. One atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Starting with our 0 0.230 atmospheres, we're going to multiply by 760 millimeters of mercury, divide by one atmosphere. And that will get rid of our units of atmospheres and get us into millimeters of mercury. Now I didn't worry about sig figs here because this isn't the end. So I just wrote the whole number from the calculator, kept it pushing. This is the partial pressure for Krypton. Now we have to sum all the partial pressures. So our total is going to be equal to the partial pressure of helium plus the partial pressure of neon, the partial pressure of argon, and the partial pressure of krypton. We get all those numbers from the problem. And when you add all those things up and take into account sig figs, 
you should get 503 millimeters of mercury. The other thing that I'll encourage you to do is to refresh yourself on addition and subtraction rules for sig figs. If you just have to add up all of the pressures, you need to use the rule for determining the number of sig figs with addition. So go back to, I believe it was prerequisite science skills, the very first chapter that we did, and refresh yourself on those rules if you need to. How are we doing so far? Everybody still good? Taking it in? Okay. Much appreciated. Let me know y'all all right. Sometimes it feels like I'm just sitting here talking to myself because it's so quiet. I'm used to face-to-face -face classes. I'm sure y'all are too. So when you're just staring at a screen, it's just like, man, this just doesn't hit the same. So we're still talking about Dalton's Law. But now we're going to talk about a concept to apply it to. Sometimes you do a reaction in water and you want to measure the volume of your gas that you make by displacement, which we talked about that in chapter two when we talked about density. When you collect your gas in a graduated cylinder, you can measure the amount of gas produced because you can read you know, the number of milliliters, right? But that's not just the gas that you care about. There's also some water vapor in there because you're collecting it over water. And every liquid at every temperature has what's called a vapor pressure. So there's some molecules of water or whatever liquid on the surface that have enough energy to break free, and so they do, and they hang out as vapor above the liquid. So that wet gas has a total pressure of whatever gas you collected plus the partial pressure of water at that temperature. So on the right, we have an example of a reaction with zinc metal and sulfuric acid. It's a single replacement reaction. You're going to make some hydrogen gas, which you can collect in this graduated cylinder. But there's also water vapor there. Now you might be wondering, okay, so there's vapor pressure. How do I figure out what that is? You don't really have to figure it out per se. You just look it up in a table. No need to memorize this table at all. Whatever information you need for the exam, it'll be given to you. So don't worry about it. I'm going to draw a line down here just to show you. This is really like a double chart, okay? Every temperature from 5 degrees Celsius all the way up to 100 in 5 degree increments. You've got the partial pressure or you've got the vapor pressure of water in millimeters of mercury. So whatever problem you have, you look up the temperature on this table. That'll tell you the vapor pressure of water. And you can figure out the pressure, the partial pressure of your gas. So let's give that a shot. We've got a sample of hydrogen gas that's collected over 40 degrees Celsius water. The atmospheric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury. And we want to know the pressure that's exerted by the hydrogen gas. 
This is still a Dalton's Law question. We just have to do approach it a little bit differently. We know that the total pressure should be equal to the partial pressure from the water vapor plus the partial pressure from the hydrogen gas. If I want to isolate the pressure of the hydrogen gas, then all I have to do is subtract the partial pressure of the water on both sides. So if we take the total pressure, subtract the vapor pressure from the water, that will give us the pressure of the hydrogen gas. But what's the total pressure? The total pressure is going to be the atmospheric pressure. The partial pressure of the water you look up on the chart. You find 40 degrees and you see 55.3 is the partial pressure for the water. You do that subtraction. Remember to apply the rules for sig figs with adding and subtracting. So again, refresh yourself if you need to. and you get 700 millimeters of mercury. Now I wrote it this way with a decimal point for a reason because this gives us three sig figs and when you subtract you have to keep all the digits up through the ones place so that means all of these digits the seven the zero and the zero are all significant. The other way that you can represent this with three sig figs is to use scientific notation. and that's three sig figs as well. So no tricks here. Make sure that you use the proper vapor pressure of water for the proper temperature and you know how to apply the rules for adding and subtracting with significant figures. That's partial pressures. I'm gonna pause here for a second let you get caught up. and we'll move on to the second to last thing. I'm not gonna go over the kinetic molecular theory in detail, but you do need to understand it to be able to answer a multiple choice question about like, okay, which one of these is a part of the kinetic molecular theory or which one is not? Nothing too detailed. But the overview of this is Gases move in random directions. They travel really quickly, and when they bump into each other, there's no attraction, there's no repulsion. So they don't lose any energy when they collide. And the average kinetic energy of a molecule of gas is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. So in a nutshell, that's what it is. Understand that concept, and you'll be good to go. This is explained better in the pre-recorded video in more detail. So go there if you need a little bit more clarity. The last gas law for this chapter is the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. We finally deal with moles. That's the amount of gas. Now the R, that's not really a property of gas. It's the ideal gas constant. 
So if you substitute in the values for STP, standard temperature and pressure, and do some calculations, that is the constant that you get with the ideal gas law. The units are liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So 0 0.0821 liters times atmosphere per mole times Kelvin. You may see it written like this. They're the same thing. The units are a little bit wonky just because everything has to cancel when you're using the ideal gas law. So if the leaders make or if the units make your brain hurt a little bit, don't worry about it. Just make sure that you know what units you your answer needs to be in. Also, this constant is only for atmospheres. So your pressure must be in atmospheres. If it's not in atmospheres, you need to convert to atmospheres first and then use the ideal gas law. So let's do a sample. How many moles of neon gas occupy 5.75 liters at STP? Well, liters, that's a volume. It doesn't really seem like we have a whole lot else to go on. But we actually do. Like I just said, STP is standard temperature and pressure. Which means our temperature is 273 Kelvin and our pressure is one atmosphere. We defined that in chapter 8 when we talked about molar volume and it is now back again in chapter 10 which is all on gases. So you'll need to know that standard temperature and pressure means 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere. N, that's what we're asked about. And whenever you have a question dealing with moles of gas and you don't see anything about being at, um, if you don't see anything about molar volume, then you need to use the ideal gas law. We're going to solve for N, which means that we're going to divide both sides by RT. Then we substitute in all of our values. Once you do that, it's just a matter of punching it into the calculator. You can use double parentheses here to make sure that everything goes according to plan.
Actually, there's a slightly better way to do it if you use the multiplication sign. So you do that divided by 0 0.0821 times 273. And that should give you 0.257 moles. And again, don't worry too much about the units on the ideal gas constant. As long as you understand what unit your answer should be in, based on what variable it is, you should be fine. If you're curious about it, you can always let me know. Final question and then we're done. This is where stoichiometry meets gas laws. This is the most complicated question that you may get for a chapter 10 question. Since ideal gas law talks about moles and stoichiometry is all about moles, we can combine the two. Nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas to produce ammonia gas. How many liters of ammonia can be produced at 0.93 atmospheres and 24 degrees Celsius from a 16 gram sample of nitrogen gas and an excess of hydrogen gas. Quite a bit. It's a paragraph for this one. But let's break down what we need to do. We're asked about how many liters of ammonia we can make. And we're given a pressure and a temperature. So we already know, can't use molar volume here because we're not at STP. So we've got to do something else. We know how many grams of nitrogen gas we're starting with. So we can convert the grams of nitrogen gas to moles of nitrogen gas and then use a mole ratio to get to moles of ammonia. Then we can use the moles of ammonia that we calculated in the ideal gas law. And we can solve for the volume that way. So for the first part, grams to moles of nitrogen gas to moles of ammonia. To go from grams to moles of nitrogen gas, we have to use the molar mass. To figure out the molar mass, you look at nitrogen on the periodic table. It's about 14.01. You multiply that by 2 because in a molecule of nitrogen gas, there are two nitrogen atoms. Then we need a mole ratio in the form of B over A to get from moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia. The B is always our unknown. The A is what we already know. So let's fill it in. So 
So that's our first one. We're going from grams to moles of nitrogen gas. And I'm sorry, that should be red. I'm going to rewrite that just to make sure that that you make the connection. Next, we have to write that mole ratio, and that comes from the balanced chemical equation. Our B in this case is ammonia, and we see a 2 in front of it, so we represent that as 2 moles of ammonia. The A in this problem, the given, is nitrogen gas. There's, only, there's no coefficient there, so there's only one. One mole of nitrogen gas. When you put this into your calculator, you're going to do 16 divided by 28.02. I like to do parentheses around that. Times 2. And this is to convince you that you have the right units. So always do that unit analysis too. Now that we have our moles, we need to take that and put it into the ideal gas law. We know that PV equals NRT, and this time we're trying to solve for volume. Divide by P on both sides. V is equal to NRT over P. Now let's assign our variables. We know N, we know T, we know P. N is what we calculated. The temperature is 24 degrees Celsius, which is 297 Kelvin. And the pressure, we're told in the problem, is 0.93 atmospheres. The R is the same point zero eight two one. Then we just plug all of that stuff into our equation. There's our moles. There's our gas constant. I'm not going to worry you with all the units. And our temperature is 297 Kelvin. Divide all that by the pressure of 0.93 atmospheres. When you do that math, you get 30 liters. We're doing two sig figs here because the pressure only has two sig figs. I'll give that a minute to sink in. But this is the hardest problem that you'll find for chapter 10. And I'll make sure that that is on the final exam review 
which I'm going to be posting this week. That brings us to the reminders, and we'll talk about next week's class as well. So your Mastering Chemistry Chapter 9 is due on Sunday the 25th. If you already completed it and you're like, man, I could have done better if I had some more information, if I would have read that it said milliliters and understood what that meant, send me a course message by 5 o'clock and let me know which problems you'd like to be able to redo. If you don't send that to me today via course messages, the opportunity is gone. Mastering Chemistry, Chapter 10. So that's all the stuff that we covered today. That's due Sunday, May 2nd by 11.59 p.m. Can't push that one back. Your take-home final is also due the next day, Monday the 3rd. I'll post the final exam a week before it's due. So the final exam review I'll post this week. And then the following week, I'll post the actual take-home exam with instructions. We completed all of Chapter 10 today. We still have one class left, and I want to leave it up to you how we use it. So I'll be posting a survey that I posted to my other class already about how you want to use the class. Just call it office hours, and you can stop by if you have a question. We can do an official you know, final exam review and do a recap of chapter 10, do some extra problems there. Or we can do a combination. We do, you know, the first hour or so review, and then maybe we leave an hour for office hours. So I'll put that up as a survey. However you answer doesn't affect your grade. It's anonymous. I don't know who answered what. I just know the percentage of who answered what. I'll send out an announcement at the end of the week, so I'll let it be up until the end of Friday. Send out an announcement over the weekend. That's all I have for you. If you have any questions, this is a good time. Otherwise, you're free to go. <laughs>